For several years now I've had logs lying around the garden from a load of conifer trees that we chopped down, getting lovely and dry in the summer and then saturated in the winter. So I thought it was about time to put a stop to that and build myself the ultimate DIY log store. Harnessing the skills that I learned from re-roofing the garage in the summer and using some tiles and battens salvaged from the old roof. So in today's video I'll be taking you through the build step by step, running through the costings and also explaining at the end a few things I might do differently next time round. Some friends had this very smart log store built a couple of years back and I decided to copy the general design, adding a few of my own changes, mostly driven by budget, the limitations of my carpentry skills and the materials available. So let's start with a quick run through of the materials and tools I used on this project. I wanted to build the log store as cheaply as possible, which meant using tantalized softwood rather than oak. The same stuff in fact I'd built my decking and pergola roof out of and bought from my local timber yard stroke DIY store. I've got 12 foot or 3.66 meter by 100 millimeter square timbers for the rear posts and front horizontal section, I suppose you'd call that the wall plate, and three 8 foot by 2.44 meter timbers for the front posts. To match the chunky design of my friend's log store, I went for 4 by 3 inch or 100 mil by 75 mil timber for the rafters and also for the ridge beam, if it's called that. I use these M6 by 150 mil masonry thunderbolt screws for the first time, 150 mil timber fastening screws, Sudal 45p expanding polyurethane glue, now relegated to this jam job because the old bottle is broken, adjust tight Robertson head screws, postcrete, recycled roof battens and tiles, lead roll, lead fixing clips, 100 millimeter deep gravel boards, and 78 by 50 mil posts. Weed matting, type 1 MOT sub base, 420 kilogram bags of sharp sand, 450 mil square paving slabs, 10 millimeter gravel and feather edge boards bought in 1.8 meter lengths. In terms of tools, I use my Evolution miter saw and Irwin Jack handsaw, bituminous paint for the posts, Dewalt half inch shank router, mattock pick and all important gloves, roughneck mutt pro, spade and wheelbarrow, saw tamper, angle grinder with diamond cutting disc and mortar raking disc, and impact driver. I've probably missed a few, but as usual, details of all the tools will be in the description below the video. Before starting the build I had the small matter of a bit of site clearing up to do, in particular a dead tree to cut down for which I use my Ryobi 18 volt chainsaw. If you're thinking of getting a chainsaw and aren't sure about electric, my advice is go for it, it's been a real game changer. And even though this is just 18 volt, I've cut down some pretty big trees with it. I thought that by cutting the root off below ground level I could forget about it, but you'll see the root put in another appearance later in the video. The final job was to scrape off some old ivy which I killed off in the summer to prevent it compromising the garage roof. I used a spade to do this. And so it was time to start constructing the framework of the log store, made much easier by having that example to copy. The longer 3.6 meter lengths of 100 mil square timber had to be specially ordered in as the timber yard didn't have them in stock. These would form the two rear posts, no need for a central post as the ridge beam, if it's called that, would be screwed to the garage wall. These and the three shorter 2.4 meter length front posts would each be set in concrete. So I started by coating the base of each in Bostic bituminous paint to a depth of 500 mil. The next job was to angle the rear posts to the angle of the roof. I went for a 45 degree pitch to match that of the garage roof, quite steep as it turned out, more on that later. But it did mean all angle work was set to 45 degrees, easy to do on my combination square. I cut these angles using my old Evolution miter saw. It wasn't deep enough to go all the way through, so I finished off each cut using my Irwin Jack Universal saw. I then had to cut 100 mil by 75 mil, actually more like 73, section out of the rear post to accommodate the ridge beam. To do this I set the depth stop on my miter saw, something I've never used before, and cut as many thin slithers as possible out of the section to be removed, so that I could then simply snap them off and tidy up with a chisel and my old planar file. I made a bit of a mistake with the depth of the miter saw as you can see here on the first rebate, but this is all part of the learning experience. I gave quite a lot of thought as to how to attach this horizontal brace to both the rear post and also to the front wall plate. Now this is more of an aesthetic than a structural element because the way I've designed these rafters, these will be mostly supporting 
the front posts. But it still needs to be attached and I was determined not to use fastening bolts for this particular element. And so I decided on another Charlie DIY at first to have a little go at loose tenons. Loose because I thought these would be easier than cutting a tenon into the actual cross horizontal brace itself. And also because I had my half inch shank router and this straight flute cutter that I bought from Wield and Tools about a year ago for a furniture project I haven't started yet. So I thought I'd route out the rear post before fixing them in place. The idea being that I'd slot in an offcut of 20 mil planed redwood, that's a pine plank to you and I, left over from the wardrobe build, using the fence to steady the router and a bit of cloth tape to attach the extraction duct to my Henry vacuum. I also have this rider corner chisel, again unused but bought for the furniture build, to square off the routed corners. Look at that. But quickly realised this wasn't necessary. For me at any rate, maybe skilled carpenters wouldn't approve. Because actually, the curved corners provide a perfect space for the polyurethane glue to work its magic in. I decided to concrete in place the rear posts. The concreting would happen in a bit, but the priority initially was to excavate the holes and fix the posts in position. I dug the holes for the posts with a combination of my spade, Roughneck Mutt Pro digging tool, which is fast becoming one of my most useful tools, and an ancient post digger borrowed from my father-in-law. Once dug and the posts in position, I decided to anchor each one to the wall close to the top with one concrete screw drilled through the post and into the wall with a six millimeter drill bit. I decided to have a go with concrete screws that don't need wall plugs, another first on this project. And with the screws 150mm long, I recessed the hole on the post with a paddle bit just to give the screws a bit more travel into the brickwork. With one post screwed to the wall, I could put a spirit level on the ridge beam to check the second post was level. You do need to use the right drill bit with concrete screws. Here's me here, trying to get away with a 5.5mm when I should have used a 6. Followed by four concrete screws across the length of the ridge beam. I've said a lot recently how you'll hardly ever need to use an impact driver, but for driving home concrete screws, it's going to be a lot easier than a drill driver. Absolutely rock solid. Then it was more digging for the front three posts. I found the best combination was the ancient post digger and then my Mutt Pro digging tool whenever I hit some stones that needed to be removed. I want to just show you the methodology I've been using for getting these posts in the right place. So I've put this lateral beam in so that I can make sure that the post is exactly 900 millimeters from the wall all the way up. It just holds it in position for me, makes life a lot easier. I've got my trusty Stabilar spirit level which enables me to make sure that I'm plumb, or as near as damn it plumb, because I can re-plumb it up when I've put the post crete in. I've also got my big square at the back with the spirit level laid on it, slightly crude, but it does enable me to make sure that the front post is perfectly square with the wall and the post at the back. Finally, I'm checking the height by putting a spirit level against the post at the back, raising the post with a bit of gravel at the bottom of the hole or excavating a little bit extra to get it in exactly the right position. And then to one of my favourite jobs, filling the hole with a third of water and then adding the fast setting post concrete mix to the water until it comes through the water, followed by the all important process of tamping through the mix with a stick to remove any air pockets and ensure an even mix. At this point I can fine tune the position of the post, check its vertical with a spirit level and add extra concrete to use up any water left in the mix. Not one of my tidiest jobs this with all the concrete spilt around the edge but you get the general idea. With the post all concreted in it was time to construct the rest of the frame, starting with that front plate and horizontal brace. I had two more mortises to route, one at each end of the brace and two on the wall plate itself. Routing out the mortises on the horizontal braces went pretty smoothly but then I messed up. Right, it's always going to happen. I've made, a, I've messed up. Um, beautiful routed joint with the assistance of the, with the fence on my router. Compare that with this uh, joint, which I decided rather lazy to freehand route. And obviously I didn't get it in the center. So I'm having to chisel more out and it's got a bit of that going on. Not massive concern because I've got some of this to fill the gap, but it is nevertheless annoying. So this time I managed to fit the fence on the edge. Not perfect, only actually fixed on, on that point there because the rod's not long enough for those. 
But even with that limitation, the results are night and day different. Look, we've got a lovely tight joint this time. Will be a bit long, but I'm going to put the glue in there. And I made that slight mistake there. Next time I make one of these, I'll turn the mortise in the front plate 90 degrees to make it easier to route with the fence and easier to lock in place during gluing. More on that in a minute. Next, I apply liberal amounts of Sudal 45P expanding polyurethane glue to the mortise and loose tenons and push the joints together. Put these screws in temporarily last night because the foam, would you believe it, was forcing the joint apart. It would have been quite nice to have used dowling rods. I didn't have dowling rods, so I settled on these adjust tight screws, which I should have screwed in before the glue set to prevent it pushing the joint apart. As you can see, I later did here. Trim off this expanding foam. Quick trim of the expanding foam and I was ready to lift the whole section into position, which was one of the trickiest structures and heaviest I've had to manhandle. The loose tenon horizontal braces fitted beautifully into the rear posts. And with the wall plate, we're calling it that now until somebody tells me what its proper term is, glued and resting on the front post, I decided this could be bolted down to the post, for which I used these 150mm timber fastening bolts. I should just mention the centre post, which I positioned using a string line, dug in the usual way, and then bolted down to the wall plate before concreting in place. And so it was onto the rafters again, back to my friend's design, but rather than making a sloping ridge beam, I decided it would be easier and possibly stronger to cut two 90 degree notches into each rafter, allowing it to sit into the beam and wall plate, and so set about cutting seven rafters from that 100mm by 73mm timber, which spaced across the wall plate gave me 600 millimeter centers and by cutting each 3.6 meter length in two just under 1.8 meters in length giving a chunky 400 millimeter overlap past the front of the log store an important point particularly if like me for now at least you're not going to bother with guttering the last job was to anchor each rafter down to the frame and I did this with, you've guessed it, the 45p polyurethane glue and the 150 millimeter timber fastening bolts All that careful measuring had paid off with a precision job that even with my OCD I was incredibly happy with. The other thing I did at this point was install a couple of 4x2 beams inside of the rafters closest to the verge as it occurred to me that if I was going to install feather edging on the side of the log store I'd need something to nail that feather edging into at roof level. I've enjoyed everything about this project so far apart from the weather which has been getting worse by the day but now it was time for one of my real DIY loves, roofing. I had a load of battens salvaged from the garage re-roof in the summer and I sorted through these in the hope of finding enough that didn't have rot or woodworm for the new roof. You might ask why when I built a new log store I put old battens on it but just look at the difference between a 1970s batten with 23 rings compared to today's fast growing tim timber with just 12. I'm also using the Hikoki 18 volt framing nailer I bought in the summer for the garage re-roof. There's a link to that video on screen now. After all the problems I had with the gas-fired Pazlode, I hired at quite a lot of expense, although clearly for a project of this size, you'd be fine with a hammer and galvanised nails. It's always tricky to get the shorter eave tiles to work with the next tile up, as I found in the summer, but by chamfering the second batten I found you can increase the angle of the first tile, allowing the second tile to sit much better on the eave tile. The other way you could do this, I guess, would be by putting in a shallower second batten. So you see how I've got about a 15 mil gap between the first two battens, which is really your rule of thumb is just to make this wide enough for the nib on the tile to get in. And after that, I've got a gap each time between battens of about 15 mil, which is probably a bit on the narrow side. You can probably go slightly larger than that, but you do have the battens spaced quite close together for these rosemary style clay tiles and to get the spacing bang on rather than using a tape measure it was easier to make a couple of wooden spaces to place in between the battens prior to nailing them in position the other point to mention here is i've got an overlap of about 25 30 mil of the tile now that was to try and help the drips clear the edge of the log store but the other reason was because i wanted the tiles to stretch across the log store without me having to cut any down so i wanted a full width of tiles all the way along which I've got to say has worked pretty well, except if I'm honest, I have had to cut down some of these tiles on the other side, but better that way than having to introduce more tile and a half because your tile isn't wide enough. 
I decided at this point to rake out the mortar for the lead flashing, which was effortless with this mortar raking disc I bought in the summer for my render crack filling video, fitted to my 18 volt grinder. Climbing the battens without the tiles did make the raking out much easier, but it also covered all the battens in brick dust. And so it was on to the best job ever, tiling. I used a shorter 30mm galvanised nail on each of the eaves tiles and longer 40mm nails on the remainder of the roof, nailing one into each tile every other course. If you're buying in tiles for a similar job, don't forget about the eave tiles which are shorter than standard and the tile and a halves which you need to place at every other tile up the roof on each side. As I explained, I did have to cut down each tile on the left hand side, which I did with the diamond blade on my 18 volt grinder. Can't recommend this Duro blade highly enough. I've used this particular blade on so many jobs, they go on forever. You're not meant to cut down the end tile, but instead the first one in, which for some reason I completely forgot on this project, having done it correctly on the garage roof. Last tile. Anyway, it was such a small reduction, you can't tell. And finally, the last tile was in place. Oh, and get yourself a tool belt if you're doing any roofing, it's essential. And so I was on to the lead flashing and in this section I owe special thanks to the Fix My Roof YouTube channel where I picked up some crucial tips for doing your lead flashing. There'll be a link to the video in the description. Couple of points to make before we start. First, my Abrax raking disc only clears the grinder by 20 mil, which therefore was the depth of the mortar joint I raked out. It's recommended to excavate 25 mil, but as you see, 20 millimeters was more than adequate for the fantastic lead clips I used. More on those in a minute. You're also meant to have 150 mil overlaps as you see here. Again, mine are much less than this. It's only a log store. I spent 60 quid as it was on a six meter, 150 mil wide lead roll without having to buy an even wider one for this. The roofing company told me to buy code 4 lead as anything thinner isn't really suitable, apparently for flashings like this. You might say this is overkill. Experienced roofers out there, do please let me know in the comments section below. I was going to use just one long piece of lead, but I learned from the roofing video that one long piece can split or otherwise ruin prematurely with expansion and contraction from the weather. And so I cut my length to just over 1.3 meters as you see here, building up the overlaps of 150 mil from left to right from the line of sight so that looking from the path, you don't see the overlaps. To shape the flashing, I improvised by clamping the lead between a couple of gravel boards for the mortar joint bender. and then used an offcut of engineered oak for the bend onto the roof and was pretty pleased with the result. To fix the lead in position, I've previously made lead chocks but was recommended these lead fixing clips by the roofing company and wow, I was so pleased with how they worked. So much more effective than lead chocks. And with the fixing clips in place, I could tap the lead down flat to the roof. The other brilliant tip I got from that video was to make lead straps to stop gravity pulling down on the lead over time. You simply nail a strap every few tiles into one of the tile holes and then bend it over once the flashing is in place. These straps also help keep the flashing overlaps down. This one was in the right place to simply bend in place, but this one wasn't. So I made a cut in the underlapping lead and bent this over to secure the overlap in place. At the end, I allowed a 100mm overlap and cut an angle like this so that I could bend the overlap under the roof verge. And I've gently tapped down this edge with a hammer. The roofing company recommended this lead neutral silicon sealant for pointing up the lead chase, but I didn't get on at all well with it. And you all know how much I like siliconing. I suppose the point is you're not meant to tool it. So instead I decided to point it up with a mortar mix, three to one sand to cement, with a bit of waterproofing admixture thrown in. Not the neatest job granted, but a lot better than using that silicon. And I even went to the effort of buying this patination oil, which you're meant to apply to prevent white staining on the lead as it ages. Uh, you're meant to apply this at the end of each working day at the very latest, and I haven't done that. I was hoping to do it today and it's raining, so it could even be too late to use this. 
I decided at this point to add braces to the structure out of that 100 by 73 mil or 4 by 3 timber that I use for the top plate and rafters. Again, copying the structure of my friend's log store. But my braces would be straight rather than curved for obvious reasons. I wasn't going to make these with tenons. I didn't see the point given they're decorative rather than structural. So I cut the 45 degree angles on my mitre saw and then glued and screwed them in place using those 75 mil adjust tight screws and of course the polyurethane glue. I use these not for the benefit of their adjusting design, but more because the head on the screw is so small you can't really see them when driven in, although I'm so disappointed with the Robertson head system. The screw bit slips out more than you'd imagine. The Torx system is far superior in my view. But with the braces in position, I was pretty happy with the way the structure was looking, and I had a couple of final jobs to do, starting with the groundworks. It was out with a mattock pick again to rake flat that trampled down mud. I decided to create a gravel board border, which if you watch my recent gravel path build vid, you'll be familiar with. I used three by two or roughly 70 by 45 millimeter posts to strengthen it. Each post set in concrete and screwed to the gravel boards with decking screws. I've gone 250 mil past the verge line on the south side and much further on the north as this may be our future path of access into the store once we knock down the dry wall. As with the path build, I screwed a batten to the back wall so I could get the levels right. And after leveling off the soil to roughly 70 mil below the top of the gravel board, I spread out some weed matting I had left over from the path build and lined the base with type one MOT sub base to a level of 40 millimeters. Oh God, this stuff, it, it's got so much water in it compared to the sub base that I used on the path a few weeks ago. It's so hard to dig, it's just, Dapping all my energy. I used my tamper to compress the type one, which was a lot harder to level than it had been with the path, given how wet the type one was. I used a piece of feather edging on a batten, as I did with the path build, the same one actually, to slide along the gravel board and batten to get the levels exactly right. I then spread a thin layer of sharp sand on top, three or four 20 kilogram bags, and leveled this in the same way, tamping it flat, and then it was onto the 450 mil square paving slabs bought from my local builder's merchant. And with it raining almost continuously, I grabbed every moment I could to try and finish off the base. My nine inch Titan angle grinder was particularly useful for notching the paving slabs around the central pillar. It's surprisingly difficult to lay paving slabs on a sand sub base because you have to get the sand absolutely flat to stop any rocking of the paving slab. All that remained was to spread 10 millimeter golden gravel around the edges. This is expensive stuff and over 100 pounds for a one ton sack. You can get similar stuff for half the price and you certainly don't need a one ton sack, which is 40, 20 kilogram bags, more like several 20 kilogram bags. But I had this left over from the path build so it seemed a shame not to use it. As I built the log store, I realized that the rain comes streaming across the hills from the south and in under the roof. So I decided to clad the south side of the store with feather edge board to keep it dry. Again, bought from the timber yard mentioned earlier. I began by building a brace out of that 70 by 45 mil timber to support the bottom piece and then gradually worked up the side, nailing the boards down with 50 mil galvanized nails from my 16 gauge 18 volt Ryobi nailer and building in a decent 50 mil overlap on each board. Time will tell if these nails are substantial enough or whether I should have just used standard galvanized nails. The boards come in 1.8 meter lengths, which was perfect as my log store is exactly 900 millimeters wide. Just another consideration to think of when you're building yours. I also decided to put a bit of feather edge at the top to stop the rain getting in and rotting that top wall plate or ridge beam, whatever we're calling it. For the time being, I'm not going to feather edge the north side, but we'll see if it's necessary. And that's it, the project is finally finished on this miserable cold day. And the next job is obviously going to have to be to fill it with all the wood that's lying around the garden. I'll do another video on that because I've got some points to make about log splitting, um, using axes, that sort of thing. So I think it could be quite useful. Now, what about the costings on this project? I'll include a full itemized list of everything that I've used on my Patreon channel. But suffice to say, for me, the project came in at... £677, which don't forget does not include the tiles, although I did have to buy eight tile and a halves, uh, or the battens. 
Now, if you were to add in the tiles and the bands, the project would have snuck in at just under a thousand pounds at 968 pounds. So it's probably appropriate at this point to discuss things that I might have done differently, mistakes I might have made, just to help you on your project if you decide you want to build one of these. What about the pitch of this roof? Well, if I'm honest looking at it, it does look a bit steep, doesn't it? As I said, I was mirroring the 45 degree angles on the garage roof, and obviously it did make it nice and easy for me when I was cutting in for these rafters and stuff like that. But bottom line, it could have been a lot shallower. And of course that is going to decrease your cost because you're going to be losing less tiles and using less lengths of rafters. More on that in a minute. The only thing I would say about the pitch is it does give me a massive amount of storage space for all those logs. And I suspect I'm going to have a few too many to get undercover initially. Related to that point, because it's an interesting impact on cost, it's not quite deep enough if I'm honest. I said to you it's 900 millimetres from front to back and you saw earlier on that there was a bit of splashing from the rain at the front of the log store. I think I could have gone out a little bit more to maybe 1.2 metres. That wouldn't have added anything to the cost, particularly if I'd lowered the pitch of the roof and it just would have meant kept the wood, uh, the logs a little bit drier. And maybe a mini guttering system like this one I installed on our pergola will minimise that dripping and provide a way of capturing the water for feeding plants. I'll let you know how I get on. I'll do an update video in a few months time on these logs. But it'll be interesting to see how we get on with the logs in here, whether they do dry properly under this shelter or whether I actually have to incorporate some sort of cover at the front. It'd be a shame to do that after putting so much work in. Somebody said to me, shouldn't you use roofing felt? Well, I don't really see the point. This is completely watertight. I don't have roofing felt on most of the roof on my cottage. This is only a log store open to the elements on three sides. So I didn't really see the point, even though I've got a little bit left over of that Tyvek from the garage rear roof. Talked about lowering the pitch of the roof, less tiles, less cost. I think also these super chunky four by three rafters that I was trying to copy my friend's design with, very expensive, one of the biggest costings on this project at 22 pounds per 3.6 meter length. Now, typically you'd only use maybe four by twos for something like this. Chunky design does look good. And I've got to say, this is the most sturdy thing I've ever built, but it would have saved a lot of cost if I'd cut down those four by threes to four by twos. Nitpicking a bit here, but roofers might look at that lead overlap, the lead flashing overlap at the edge, 100 mil is quite wide it means you can't bend the lead over underneath the verges quite so much. Roofers will probably comment on that. And I suppose the other point to make is that I'm conscious that at this time of the year, I've just about got this project in, in the nick of time, because that fast setting post creep by the last day I was using it was taking a long time to go off. Last couple of weeks, it's been raining almost continuously. It's been a tough project to get across the line in this weather. But of course you do want those logs under cover. So maybe you're just going to have to brave the elements and get yours constructed. So that's it for today. I hope you found this video useful. If you have, it would be great if you could give it a thumbs up below. As usual, details of everything I've spoken about today will be in the description below the video, which you can access on your smartphone by clicking where it says more and on your PC by clicking on the show more button. Thanks for watching today. And if you've stumbled on my channel for the first time, it would mean so much to me to have you subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the link here. And don't forget to click the bell notification icon so you get notified of all my future uploads. See you soon.